you have to have hope coexisting with anxiety and depression because those things are real. And I love what Nicole says there. And I wish that somebody would have told me that in 2015 because I had to learn that truth the hard way. In 2015, uh, I was transitioning out of the army and my wife and I was, were buying a house and I began to develop numbness in my fingers and in my toes. Uh, so I went to a, uh, my doctor, I went to a neurologist and they decided I needed to have an MRI. And for whatever reason, that MRI just totally freaked me out. Uh, I'm not claustrophobic, but it just really scared me. And I thought they were gonna find some kind of uh, long-term degenerative neurological issue. And so I became convinced that I had ALS. And despite every test coming back negative, doctors telling me I was fine, I could not get over it. I started seeing uh, a therapist about this and what it came down to was I was anxious. The stressors of my life had just piled up, the dam had broke, and I was anxious. I was anxious. And I don't know where you're at today. I know there's a lot of things to be anxious about. I know that there's a hurricane uh, coming to uh, Texas uh, because apparently hurricane season didn't take 2020 off along with every other terrible thing happening this year. Uh, there's wildfires in California. There's a pandemic. Schools can't really figure out sometimes what they're doing or even what's the best thing to do. It feels like we're learning on the go and all of this stuff is incredibly anxiety inducing uh, a sort of situation for all of us. Now, I don't know whether or not you struggle with anxiety, like I do. It's a chronic, uh, uh, long-term issue for me. Uh, or whether this season has really just uh, put it into your life, or whether you just know somebody that's really wrestling with this. Today, as we walk through this Not Okay series, I want us to talk about anxiety and ways that we can cope with this season of worry. And the way that we're going to do this today is we're going to look at four things out of Genesis chapter 32, which is not a classic passage on anxiety. But I want to look at this because I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of Jacob and experience sort of his anxiety and learn from it as we walk with him through this season in his life. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 32, look at four things about anxiety today that we can kind of make observations about. We're going to look at the perspective, uh, the posture, the plan and then what the payoff is for all of this anxiety that we have to go through. And one of the things I want to draw on as well as scripture are the writings of a 17th century Puritan minister in England named Richard Baxter. And the reason why I want to look at what he has to say is this is not new stuff. We talk about anxiety a lot, but this is something that Christians have been dealing with for centuries. It's not a new development. So a lot of our practical application is going to come from his advice that he gives to his own parishioners 400 plus years ago. So let's dive in and let's talk about the perspective of the anxious, the perspective of the anxious. Now we're going to pick up Jacob's story kind of in the middle of his life. He's been living with his uncle Laban uh, out of his homeland. And the reason why he's living there is because he stole his, the, his brother's birthright and his brother's blessing. And his brother has sworn he's going to kill him. And so Jacob leaves because Jacob's kind of a deceiver. He's a trickster. And his brother is kind of this hunter, very aggressive type. And so uh, Jacob leaves and he goes and stays with Laban. Laban proves to be just as much of a trickster as Jacob. Laban tricks uh, Jacob into marrying uh, one of his daughters when Jacob wanted to marry the other one. And so Jacob winds up staying there for, for 14 plus years, about two decades, staying with Laban. And over that time, he begins to pull some pranks and some tricks on Laban to the point where he robs him of some of his flocks and his, his herds. All of this comes to a head and they both decide before it gets out of hand that Jacob needs to leave. He needs to go back home before it gets violent. So Jacob leaves Laban and he's going back home to Esau. And, and this is where we begin to see this perspective of the anxious because this confrontation with Esau begins to induce some anxiety on the part of Jacob. And so this perspective really is twofold for anxious people. And the first thing that we see is that this perspective is divided. It's not focused. Let's look at Genesis chapter 32, verse 1. Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Now, uh, this, this idea of multiple camps is really interesting because it kind of uh, guides the entire story uh, uh, that we're looking at today. Jacob throughout his life is having to deal with relationships with other people, relationships with God, and, and, and just like you and I. And what's interesting about this is he says that God's camp is something he stumbled upon, his, his military camp, his army, where his army is. Later on in, in, in chapter seven, or in verse seven and eight, Jacob divides his own family into multiple camps, into two camps. 
One uh, goes one way and one goes the other way so that if Esau attacks one, he won't be able to get the other one. And so Jacob sort of divides his life in two. What's interesting about this is that the Greek word, the New Testament word for anxiety that appears numerous times, it means to be divided. So many of us live divided lives. Anxious people live divided lives. When you're at home and you're supposed to be at home with your family, are you thinking about work? When you're at work, are you thinking about being at home? When you're, when you're studying or when you're, when you're supposed to be asleep, are you thinking about all the things that you're supposed to be doing? And when you're going through your day, are you thinking about all the ways that you just wish you could just go to sleep? When you're playing with your kids at home, when you're, when you're trying to worship, when you're trying to do things that you know are good, is your mind just wandering constantly to all the other things you need to do? Are you divided? That's a classic symptom of anxiety. And the technology that we have nowadays uh, that kind of does that to us as well. Our phones, the ability to Zoom call. I can talk to somebody around the world and not leave my home. I'm literally in one, two places at once experiencing life that way. We're divided people. We're not able to focus. What are you divided about today? Where is your attention going? Anxiety is strengthened by this. Anxiety is strengthened by rampant thoughts going in multiple directions. And so we have to try to get a hold on it because anxiety, uh, a symptom of it is being divided in our thoughts. Another one is pessimism. Another part of our perspective is pessimism. Look what it says in verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. And then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Esau is incredibly pessimistic. He's wandering into the territory where Esau lives and he thinks, man, this is going to end badly. This is going to be a violent confrontation. And so he sends messengers ahead to let Esau know, hey, I'm coming and there's going to be some stuff with me. I don't want there to be conflict. And the report back is Esau's coming with a small army and he's coming right towards Jacob. And it says that he's greatly afraid and distressed. Esau's coming. Now, now, for Jacob, this is a unique story in his life that's anxiety-inducing. But for many of us that struggle with anxiety, we call this Monday. Esau's always waiting around the corner. He's always there. We, we go from one conflict, we go from one Laban to an Esau every day of our lives. Always worried about the worst possible thing that can happen. Something's always out to get us. This is called catastrophic thinking, and it affects us more than you might think. In fact, Richard Baxter says that those of us with anxiety are utterly incapable of enjoying anything, and it's true. And the reason why it's true is because how can you enjoy the things that God has blessed you with when you're convinced that Esau is waiting around the corner to take it from you? What's your Esau? What are you worried about today? What are you afraid is going to come and take it all away? What are you afraid that you're going to lose? Is it your job? This is economically uncertain times. It's a valid fear, but does it dominate your thoughts? Are you afraid you're going to lose your marriage because you and your your spouse are just together all the time because of this epidemic and you realize that maybe you're not as strong as you thought you were? Are you afraid you're going to lose your marriage? Are you afraid you're never going to get married at all? Because you can't go out on dates, and when you do go on a date, you're both hidden behind a mask. Or you're stuck outside in the Texas heat sweating puddles. I'm never going to get married. Or maybe you're afraid you're going to lose your health, you're going to get sick, or somebody you love is going to get sick, and somebody's going to die, and this whole thing is just terrible. What's your Esau? What's your boogeyman coming around the corner? What are you pessimistic about? And here's the difference between preparing for worst-case scenarios and and anxiety. In anxiety, you're not just preparing for a worst-case scenario. You are thinking that the worst-case scenario is likely and probable. That's what's going to happen. And that's where Jacob's mind goes. He thinks the only reason why Esau is coming to him armed with 400 men is to kill him and take back the stuff that Jacob took from him 20 years ago. There's no other reason why. The perspective of the anxious is divided and it's pessimistic. But we don't have to stay there. We can adopt a different 
posture. So let's talk about the posture of the anxious. Now, Jacob's life, all throughout his life, he's always had a scheme, a plan, Ocean's Eleven style, always ready to come up with some way to get out of the predicament that he's in. And so as we're running into this scene, we're thinking, all right, Jacob, what's your plan, buddy? What's your, how are you going to get out of this? Where's your George Clooney? Get your people together and come up with something. And Jacob does something unexpected. He does something that we expect from Abraham or from Joseph, but not from him. Look what he does in verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with, you, with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. But you said I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for a multitude." This shows us the posture that we're supposed to adopt because Jacob is scared. And what he does, rather than coming up with a plan, whether a scheme that we are used to him doing, he prays. And this is the longest prayer in Genesis, the longest one. And it's beautiful. It's dependent. It's, It's recognizing I'm not deserving of what you give me, God. You're the one who made these promises and I need you to stick by them because I'm scared. I need you to protect my family. Who hasn't prayed a prayer like that in their life? One of total dependence on God. And this shows us kind of the first part of a posture we need to adopt. And it's a posture of humility. We need to be humble. Jacob says he's not worthy. I'm not worthy of all the things you've given me. I'm not worthy of of all this. I'm not worthy of your love, but Lord, you've given it to me and I need you to back it up. I need you to back it up. So many of us aren't humble when we approach our worries and fears. We think we need to push through it. We gotta white knuckle it. We gotta gotta get through it. It's weakness that you're scared. It's weakness that you're afraid. You just stuff it down. I don't know if that's because you have outdated ideas on mental health. I don't know if that's because the pace of your life demands that you can't take time to get that part of your life in order. I don't think, I don't know if maybe it's because you think you're just so strong and that you're just gonna push through it. And this could apply to clinical, clinical, clinical anxiety, or it could apply to just dealing with an anxious situation. But the bottom line is, most of us don't want to admit that we're scared because we're too proud to admit that we're scared, that we're struggling. We won't admit our anxieties to the Lord, and we certainly won't admit them to other people. And look, it took me a long time to admit it. I thought I could just white-knuckle my way through being anxious, and it almost broke me. You've got to go to the Lord for help. You've got to go to other people for help. You cannot take care of anxiety by yourself. And here's why. It is a self-focused problem. Anxiety makes me think about all the things that I'm going to lose, all the things I'm afraid of. It turns me in on myself. And so if I try to handle it on my own, guess what that does? It just makes you more self-focused. And it gives anxiety an even greater, more fertile ground to grow in. It's just going to feed itself. So you've got to be humble and you've got to admit you need help. The second thing you need to do is you've got to be grateful. You've got to be grateful. Look at what Jacob says at the end of verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you've shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. I almost wonder if Jacob, when he's kind of dividing everybody up into camps and he's like, okay, you 20 donkeys, you go here. You other 20 donkeys go this way. You know what? No, let's bring five more over here because I like these donkeys. And he's dividing everything up and he's like, you know what? I didn't, I didn't have 20 donkeys the last time I crossed this river. All I had was my staff. Okay, let's keep dividing sheep. You guys go, you know what? I didn't have sheep the last time. I wonder if in his time of being anxious and trying to protect all of his stuff, what he wound up doing was realizing all the stuff that God had blessed him with. And in taking an inventory, trying to protect himself, he winds up that he's incredibly blessed. When you are dealing with anxiety, we almost make a catalog of the things we're afraid to lose. What are you afraid to lose? We've talked about this. Maybe you're afraid you're going to lose your health, your job, your marriage, whatever it is. But what if, while you're worried about those things, you turn that into an opportunity to praise and worship God for even letting you have those things in the first place? God, I'm afraid I'm going to lose it, but God, thank you so much for even letting me have it in the first place. I don't deserve it. Anxiety is all about a fear of losing something. 
But while you're ruminating on all the things to lose, have an opportunity to praise and worship God for what he's blessed you with. Richard Baxter says this, spend as a great a part of your prayers in confessing mercy received as in confessing sin committed and in praising God as in lamenting your own miseries. Thanksgiving and praise are greater duties than confessing sin and misery. Our posture has to be one of humility and it needs to be one of gratitude. Otherwise, you're just going to keep turning in on yourself and you're going to self-destruct. You can't beat anxiety on your own and you can't beat it by being worried that you're going to lose everything that you have. You've got to be grateful. You've got to be humble. But just because we have this posture of humility now and gratitude doesn't mean that we should just sit on our hands and be like, all right, God's going to take care of it. No, no, no. It's just the opposite of what Jacob does. Jacob develops a plan and we need a plan too. So we need to talk about the plan of the anxious. So rather than reading this, it's a rather lengthy section. I'm just going to tell you what Jacob does from verses 13 to 21. So he knows Esau's coming and what he decides to do is to overwhelm him with gifts. So he divides again his groups up into a group of donkeys, herds, flocks, and all this stuff. And he sends them in waves to Esau. So he staggers them out. And every time Esau runs into one, a servant is supposed to say, your servant Jacob basically gives you these things. And this isn't necessarily Jacob trying to buy Esau off. Based on the tone and the context of what's going on, Jacob's actually admitting to the fact that I probably have these things wrongfully because these things are probably supposed to be Esau's in the first place. And so as Esau's coming, probably angry, right? He's hitting wave upon wave upon wave of remorse and generosity on the part of Jacob that hopefully, and Jacob says this, by the time they come face to face, Esau's anger will have been abated And he might actually forgive. He says accept, which is another way of saying forgive me for what I've done to him. And here again, you see Jacob with a plan. He's got a plan. Often when you have anxiety, you like to make plans. The problem is you don't stick with any one of them because you allow your emotions to dictate what you do. You allow how you feel to dictate what you do. And we've talked about this every single week that we've walked through this Not Okay series. We've talked about how you have to rest on facts, on what you know, and not just what you feel. Emotions aren't bad. Having feelings isn't bad. It's never wrong to have those feelings. You just can't let them be in the captain's chair. They can't run the show when you're dealing with anxiety because you can't trust them. I remember when I was in the midst of this anxiety, I was having chest pains or something, and I asked my doctor, I was like, Doc, how can I know when something, my body's telling me something's legitimately wrong and when it's not? And my doctor said, you can't. You can't. Your feelings are going to lie to you. They're going to lie to you. Remember, the Greek word for being anxious is being divided, and our feelings often divide us. And they want us to have a bunch of different plans, and we need one central plan, one focused plan to deal with the thing that we're afraid of. And here's why you need to do that, because you can't shut down. Every time you become anxious, every time you become scared, you can't just close up shop. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep living your life. So you've got to be able to to build the boat, to repair the ship while you're still in it. So when confronting and planning your life, dealing with a situation or a season of your life in anxiety, you've got to come up with a plan. And there's some helpful things that Richard Baxter talks about that can help us do just that. The first thing is, don't beat yourself up that you can't can't accomplish everything that you want to accomplish. Don't beat yourself up that you didn't knock out everything you meant to. You're you're dealing with a problem. You're dealing with with a sickness in some ways that's just the same as having a cold or the flu. You wouldn't beat yourself up if you worked uh, four hours a day because you had the flu. So why beat yourself up over a season of anxiety where you're just not able to be as productive? Keep yourself busy, though, at the same time. Keep yourself busy in something good and constructive and practical. Avoid, as much as possible, abstract work. Work that makes you in solitude alone, because it's not good to be alone in the midst of those circumstances. It turns you in on yourself. Surround yourself with cheerful, encouraging, uplifting people. I like to call this my anxiety Avengers. I like to assemble my Avengers as much as I can. These are cheerful people that I can call. There's a lot of people that may need you, But you need to have two, three people in your life that you can reach out to and say, I'm struggling, I need help, I need guidance, I need strength, I need somebody to cheer me up. I need someone to tell me that I'm spiraling. I need somebody to tell me that what I'm feeling is legitimate. So surround yourself with cheerful people. When you make a plan to tackle something, have somebody else look at it. Have a faithful friend look at it and say, does this sound like a good plan or does this sound like I'm just kind of running off the rails? Have them look at it, talk to you about it. And then lastly, do not get discouraged by a seeming lack of progress. Don't get discouraged by a lack of progress. We are obsessed 
with progress in our country? When are we going to go back? When are we going to have to stop wearing masks? When are we going to get done with this virus? When are we going to move forward? When are we going to graduate? When am I going to do this? When am I going to get married? How do I know if I'm, if I'm growing as a disciple of Christ? How will I know? What's the metric? What's the metric? What's the metric? We're obsessed with progress. And I get it. We, we don't want to feel like we're wasting time. But when you're struggling with anxiety and, and other mental illnesses, progress looks different. And you can't sit here and measure what you're doing by what everybody else is doing. One, that's comparison and it's not good anyway. But there are things that we should be getting out of our anxiety. So let's talk about that real quick. Let's talk about, as we close, what's the payoff here? If God has told us in his word, and he has, that I'm not supposed to be anxious, why would he let me sit here in a state? In fact, in my case, why would I have a clinical problem where I can't stop being anxious? Why would God do that to me? What's the payoff here? And there's actually a payoff that I I think is really worthwhile. And I'm going to divide it up into three things. Basically, three things that we trade our anxiety for that you see at the end of Jacob's story. Now, this is the high watermark of Jacob's story. This is where we see uh, God doing something. And why is God allowing Jacob to walk through this season? And the answer is he wants to make him more like him. He wants to make Jacob closer to him. He wants to draw him closer to him. In our case, in our day and age, what we would say is he wants to make him more like Jesus. He's crafting him and sculpting him. This struggle that he's in is there so that Jacob can be everything that God wants him to be. So let's look at this passage. The first thing that you're going to trade your anxiety for is presence. You're going to trade it for presence. Look at verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had, and Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. What an absolutely crazy verse. And what a terrifying verse. If you're struggling with anxiety, one of the things that I've talked about a lot today is you shouldn't be alone. And here Jacob is alone. The night before, he has this big encounter with his his brother that he knows isn't going to go well. He believes, he's convinced it's not going to go well. He wants his rest and he wants to be alone. And all of a sudden this guy shows up and ambushes him. I imagine the scene being something like this. He's like bedding down. He's getting ready to go to sleep. And he sees some guy walking up. He's like, oh, hey, man, what's up? And then all of a sudden the dude's just on top of him, wailing on him. What's going on here? That sentence is terrifying. Well, what we find out later on as we read the passage is this is actually a theophany. This is where God shows up in a way that somebody can interact with, in a physical sort of way that somebody can interact with. This isn't, necess- this isn't the incarnation. This isn't necessarily uh, Christ showing up early. Uh, we don't have time to get into all that. What this is, is God condescending to interact with Jacob in a way that he will understand. Because God could absolutely obliterate Jacob in a word. It's not an even wrestling match. What God does, though, is he, in, uh, he, he comes to Jacob in a way that Jacob can embrace and engage with and understand with. Jacob stays up wrestling all night long. And who in the world hasn't had something like this happen to them? You've got a, a test tomorrow. You've got a presentation tomorrow. You've got a big day at work. Or, or you've got a, a, a doctor's appointment tomorrow that you're worried about. And you stay up all night long wrestling with your anxiety, wrestling with your fear, wrestling with what you're worried about. You don't have to wrestle with those things alone. God, in in condescending to Jacob the night before this big encounter, what he shows us here is that God wants to wrestle with our problems with us. Sometimes he wants us to wrestle with him about our problems. God shows this again and again. And the best case, the best picture of this is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God puts on flesh and dwells amongst us, not for an evening like he does with Jacob. He spends 30 plus years with us all to rescue us, to die for us, to show us how to walk with the Lord and to give us the ability, the strength to do this by putting our faith and trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. God has shown time and time again that he wants to be with us. He's not leaving us alone in our anxiety and our fear. He is drawing close to us in the midst of us, so close that we are, are, it feels like a struggle with God, not necessarily a struggle with anxiety. That's how it feels. God desires to be with his people. You don't have to be alone in your anxiety. God wants to be with you. He wants to wrestle it with you. So we get God's presence for our anxiety. But we also get dependence. Look at verse 25. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket 
And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go for the day is broken. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. At the end of their, their struggle, God touches Jacob's hip, presumably injuring it forever. This is a permanent now disability that Jacob will have. And he doesn't let go of God and he says, you're going to bless me. I want your blessing. Why does Jacob do this? Here's why I think he does this. Because think about what a disaster this is. He's about to go into a conflict with his brother that he believes firmly wants to kill him. And when you're encountering somebody, I have never encountered somebody that I know of that wanted to kill me. But basically, what you have are the fight or flight options, right? Am I going to stand and fight against this person or am I going to try to run away? Both of those situations, having two good legs, is a really good thing to have. And so Jacob is now going into a very physical conflict with somebody that on Jacob's best day probably would wipe the floor with him. And he goes in with a brand new disability that he has not had any time to figure out how to deal with. And he says, you're going to bless me. And here's why he says that. Because Jacob recognizes that having God on my side is worth two good legs. Having a disability, having, having God affect me in a way that doesn't allow me to walk is a worthwhile sacrifice if I can rely on God, if that God is going to fight for me. It's a net gain to lose my leg, but to have God is a net gain. And Paul talks about this. He says, everything I have to gain, I count it as rubbish. I count it as loss for the sake of Christ Jesus. How amazing is that? What does that show us today in our own anxiety, our own fears and worries? We need to be dependent on God. And you may hate your anxiety. You may hate the fact that you're worried and afraid. I did. I thought it made me weak. I thought it made me ridiculous. I thought it made me a coward. And I remember one, one evening, I was cleaning the, the dishes with my wife, and I looked at her in the midst of all this stuff that I was going through, and I said, honey, I'm really sorry that I'm not stronger for you. And she looked at me, and I remember this, she looked at me, and, and I hope that your spouse is like this. She said, I think you're strong because you're willing to seek help. Strength is seeking the dependence on the Lord. And it was so encouraging. Hold on to that today. I'll be honest with you, there's a part of me that would really like to not be an anxious person anymore. But I'm afraid that if I weren't anxious, I would be more independent of God. And I'm afraid of the person that I would be in that scenario more than I'm afraid of my own anxiety. And so I gladly take the anxiety if it makes me dependent on the Lord. And that doesn't mean I'm holier or whatever. It just means I've lived with it long enough to recognize the advantage that it gives me. And it's one of dependence. Baxter brilliantly says this, when we go to God, we go to love and light and liberty. But when we go down into ourselves, we look into a dungeon, a prison, a wilderness. You've got to put your faith in God every day. If you've never done that before, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord, you can do that. You can do that today. You can text one of the numbers and the names that we gave you today. And you can say, hey, I want to come to know Jesus. And somebody will get in touch with you. If you've never depended on Christ, you are missing out on the greatest blessing that you will ever have. Let your anxiety lead you to dependence on him. And the last thing we get is transformation. Look at verse uh, 27. 27. He says, and he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and you've prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, For I have been, I've seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. And the sun rose upon, up upon him as he passed Penuel limping because of his hip. The blessing that God gives Jacob is a little unexpected, right? He doesn't really bless him with like an army or, or this guy that can wrestle really good. He doesn't really send him with him. What he does is he changes his name. He just changes his name. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird. No, but it changes the whole character of the story because Jacob is somebody who's a deceiver, a liar, a cheat. And what God says is you're a new person. You've become a new human being. You are now Israel. You are somebody who struggles with God and with men. And the implication there is you're somebody who has prevailed. You have victory. I don't know what your name is today. I don't know what people call you behind your back, but some of you watching today, people call you somebody who's a worry work or somebody who's fearful, somebody who's anxious. God wants to change your name today. And he wants to change your name to the victorious. To the victorious, to the one who struggles with their anxiety and 
prevails. God wants to give you a new name today. He wants to make you a new creation today. Because when you struggle in the power of the Lord, that victory is certain. It's certain. Whether it's in this life or the next. Now, I don't know whether or not God wants to free you from your anxiety and make you not anxious for the rest of your life. That's not been my experience, nor has it been my case. What God wants to do is to make you more like his son. And if he uses his, your anxiety to do that, then even though it's hard, it's something to be grateful for. So what I want to close with is some practical instruction on dealing with anxiety. And this is from Richard Baxter. One, get outside, get some fresh air. God is a God of creation. You can encounter him there just as much anywhere else. Get outside, breathe some fresh air. Be in scripture and prayer. Faith cannot be faith unless it is based on the word of God. Jacob does not turn loose of God until God blesses him. Don't turn loose of your Bible until it blesses you in the midst of your anxious struggles. Focus your thoughts on what you know is right and good. Don't go into the abstract or the possibilities. Focus on what you know. And then Baxter says this at the end. My last advice is this. Strive for the cure of your disease and commit yourself to the care of your physician and obey him. Don't be like most who will not believe that medication will do them any good. I take a little pill every day that helps make my anxiety manageable. And for a long time, I was ashamed of it. I got off of it and then I got back on it. You know when I got back on it? I got back on it January of this year, right before all this anxious stuff happened in our world. And I'm doing much better in the midst of it. Some of us don't want to take medication. Some of us don't want to go see a counselor. Baxter, again, remember, a 1700s or 1600s pastor is like, you should take medicine. So whatever archaic ideas you have about taking medication or going and seeing a counselor, there's a guy who lived 400 years ago, the definition of archaic, who thinks that idea is crazy, is ridiculous. Take medicine if you need it. Go see a doctor if you can. Go talk to a therapist. Being anxious doesn't have to be the only thing about you. So remember, the, the perspective of the anxious is one of division and one of pessimism. If that spells you today, you might want to start talking to somebody today about dealing with anxiety. Then develop a new posture, one of humility and one of gratitude. Then make a plan doesn't have to be a big deal. Make a plan and then look for God to develop those payoffs. Look for increased dependence on him. Look for that transformation. Look for his presence in your life and it will be a huge blessing to you. I hope you have a great week and I hope that God gives you victory over this. Let's pray together. Father God, uh, you are good to us, Lord, because you do not abandon us in the midst of our struggles and our trials. Many of us are worried today, Lord. I pray that you would set us free from that worry. At the very least, Lord God, you would show us how you're shaping us in the midst of our fear. And I pray that in our worry and in our fear, we would not sin against you. We love you, Father, and we trust you to lead us. In your son's name, amen. <laughs>